Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, the Institute's president, and it is a pleasure to see so many friends and colleagues here in person for the culmination of our Macro Week 2023 and an incredibly important event in its own right. It's our privilege today to host an event with Yi Gong, Governor of the People's Bank of China. I believe that this is Governor Yi's uh, first public speech in the US since COVID. And I also believe and am happy to note this is his first speech in the US since his reappointment as governor. If I may be allowed a little bit of being a fanboy, um, those of us who've known Yi Gong for some time in the community of international economic policymakers recognize him as a true technocrat in the best sense of the word someone evidence-based, someone open to discussion, someone frank in their views, and most of all, someone motivated by just trying to do the right policy. And for that, we are grateful to the leadership of China for wisely reappointing Governor Yi to lead the People's Bank. Um, he has been the governor since March 2018. He previously was Vice Governor of the People's Bank and Director of the State Administration of Foreign Exchange, SAFE. Um, those positions he held since 2007 and 2009. He has an extensive economics background. He has a doctorate in economics from the University of Illinois. He taught at the University of Indiana for eight years, uh, yeoman work. Um, he returned to China to teach economics and serve as the deputy director for the Center of Economic Research at Peking University from 1994 to 1997, and then joined the People's Bank then. Um, the governor is speaking on the record today, for which we are extremely grateful. We at the Peterson Institute appreciate him joining his peers from the central banking and finance ministry community in making this the forum that it is. Um, and we thank the People's Bank for doing that. There will be a speech by the governor, some questions by me, and then we will open the floor. Uh, the people in this room are invitation only, so any of you are allowed to ask questions. The way we will do it is you will ideally go to the mic standing there in the middle, and we will recognize you. Uh, with that, the governor is going to be speaking on Chinese monetary policy, practice, and rationale. Uh, Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Adam. Uh, as a uh, central bank uh, governor, I, you see, monetary policy operation, I like to uh, precise, but I'm not as precise as Adam uh, he is, uh, you see up to the second. So uh, it's a, a pleasure for me uh, to be here, to see uh, so many uh, old and new friends here. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, share with you some of my thoughts on uh, uh, China's uh, uh, monetary policy uh, and see uh, uh, what is uh, the uh, uh, thinking uh, behind uh, our monetary policy so uh, I'd like to go through, uh, basically uh, explain how we uh, consider uh, interest rate policy and then uh, let the exchange rate uh, determined by the market. And then at the end, I will uh, say a little bit about the uh, uh, structural uh, monetary policy, uh, especially supporting uh, small and medium enterprises and uh, green finance. So that's uh, basically the, the three parts of the uh, uh, speech. And uh, you, you see we certainly uh, operating uh, monetary policy and uh, uh, Taylor rule is uh, uh, important to us. And also we uh, uh, think that uh, interest rate is uh, most important in the monetary policy setting and uh, we consider the long-term opti optimal trajectory and uh, also uh, tr consider uh, the relationship uh, of the real interest rate and uh, the uh, potential uh, economic uh, growth rate. Uh, so in this kind of uh, 
uh, thinking, uh, I think uh, uh, the best way is probably to set the uh, real interest rate uh, more or less equal to the potential growth rate. Uh, both variables are real, but it's uh, fairly controversial uh, as far as how to calculate the real interest rate and how to uh, calculate the uh, uh, potential uh, growth rate. And we all know that uh, if interest rate is too high, uh, that uh, probably uh, dampen the uh, growth. And uh, if interest rate is uh, too low, uh, that may fuel inflation and uh, generate uh, bubbles. Uh, so, so that uh, uh, we uh, try to uh, uh, avoid uh, either uh, interest rate is too high uh, or uh, too low. And uh, for practical purposes, if we have the difficulty to calculate uh, uh, real interest rate and the potential growth rate, and uh, to be a little bit conservative, uh, I try to make the uh, real interest rate uh, slightly below uh, potential growth rate. That, that is the uh, overall uh, strategy. And uh, this literature says that uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, schools and the thinkings about monetary policy. Uh, I think all people here, uh, you are expert, you're familiar with this kind of literature and the history. Uh, basically, uh, you see, uh, some people want a more pro proactive approach, like a amplification the strategy, right? Say that uh, we have monetary policy have to do uh, counter cyclical and the Keynesian uh, theory and the Bernanke uh, financial acceleration uh, and also the history of a great depression and uh, also the history of a great inflation occurred in 1970s. Uh, that's all uh, in our uh, mind, right? So basically. Uh, one school of people is try to uh, uh, counter cyclical and think that uh, uh, you see financial accelerator and then uh, monetary policy should be uh, uh, fairly uh, counter cyclical and fairly uh, active uh, that that intervene uh, market uh, with uh, uh, strengths that that's one thinking. Uh, and uh, uh, other uh, school of thinking is a, a more conservative approach, and uh, we can call it a attenuation. Uh, the one of the uh, literature of attenuation is Brinard, 1967. Uh, it's basically saying that uh, uh, if you less certain about the uh, situation, you're probably acting a little bit uh, conservative and leave some leeway uh, when you make uh, the decision. Uh, I was trained as an econometrician um, when I do my PhD uh, uh, program, and uh, my PhD thesis is on a stand estimator. Uh, basically, a stand estimator is uh, uh, take the uh, least square estimator uh, least square estimator is the unbiased estimator, but a uh, stand estimator make it a shrinking toward the uh, overall mean a little bit, so that if you calculate the, the risk function, which is the square, the sum of the square of the deviation, a stand estimator is uh, the, the risk function is always smaller than the uh, uh, least square uh, estimator. What does that mean um, in uh, uh, interest rate policy? Uh, to make the long story uh, simple, basically uh, to this conservative uh, policy or attenuation policy, when I consider uh, interest rate decision, uh, basically I consider the cyclical as well as across region, right? We know we have in the cyclical, you have a booming area, you have recession area, and so on, so forth. And, and each cycle 
take some time, right? Which means that uh, basically I make a decision of interest rate based on the Chinese economy situation. But uh, uh, you consider the situation now, but uh, you're also aware the cycle will go how long and what will be the next stage of the cycle. So, so in, on the time horizon, uh, we look at a different cycle, a different uh, uh, cycle of the economy. And also on the regional cycle, uh, I focus on China, but I also look at uh, United States, Europe, and ASEAN, uh, and Japan, and so on and so forth, across the region. And uh, my overall thinking is, you see, you make a decision ac according to the Chinese situation. This is the decision now. But uh, you have to look at uh, the uh, over the cycle and over the region uh, average and make your decision a little bit cautious, which is shrinking toward the uh, cycle average and the regional uh, average, which means that uh, you uh, basically uh, fully uh, recognize the uh, uh, time lag of the monetary policy and also uh, look ahead and try to uh, uh, acting and, uh, and uh, adjusting uh, ahead. So that's uh, uh, basically the, uh, the uh, uh, philosophy I want to uh, convey. And uh, we, we all familiar golden rule and uh, uh, we can uh, also use the word golden mean. Uh, golden mean is uh, uh, a Chinese philosophy uh, and also uh, it, it's a philosophy of uh, Aristotle uh, that, that, that is uh, uh, with some similar thinking uh, of the story I, ju I just de described, right? So, so that uh, you, you, you face the current situation but you have to look a little bit uh, in the past and in the future and also you have to, you face, you focus on China, but you have to look a little bit on uh, the rest of the region of the earth. So, so that's, and then take the, the mean into your consideration, uh, shrinking your estimate toward that mean, but uh, the, the bulk of the consideration is still your focusing uh, economy, which is uh, uh, Chinese economy. That, that is uh, the, the uh, uh, golden mean uh, uh, philosophy uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. So uh, let me uh, give you a few examples to indicate uh, uh, how we implement that kind of uh, thinking. And uh, you, you see the interest rate policy and uh, you can see uh, this is the uh, situation of uh, uh, all the way from 2015 to uh, 2023. That that that's the period, and uh, the the first example is uh, look at uh, 2018, and you see uh, Federal Reserve uh, start to increase the interest rate in 2015, and by by the time of 2018, uh, Federal Reserve increase interest rate four times during during uh, this year. And uh, uh, you see, theoretically, if you consider the balance of payments and also the uh, uh, cross-border uh, capital movement, uh, usually developing countries should follow the U.S. Uh, hiking. And in uh, 2018, they just uh, increase uh, interest rate just five bips at the beginning of the year and then remaining uh, the same, no change of interest rate. Uh, that, that, that was in uh, 2018. And uh, in 2020, and COVID uh, started, and you see uh, the uh, blue line, uh, blue line is the uh, uh, U.S. Fed fund rate, and uh, the red line is the China Interbank uh, seven-day repo rate, and also the green light is the PBOC seven-day 
uh, repo uh, market operation uh, rate. So that uh, we use the uh, seven day open market operation to basically uh, targeting on the China interbank uh, seven day repo rate. Uh, that, that's um, pretty much our uh, benchmark rate. And uh, so that in uh, 2020, uh, where uh, the U.S. is cutting uh, interest rate uh, several times uh, very aggressively, and then you, you see that uh, uh, People's Bank of China only cut interest rate 20 bips, uh, just slightly, and uh, our uh, market rate uh, uh, went down a little bit and then uh, go more or less normal again. Uh, so, so that uh, you, you, you Federal Reserve is cutting, given the the struck of of COVID, uh, it, it, it's cutting uh, interest rate uh, aggressively and uh, basically to zero interest rate, close to zero interest rate policy. But we we uh, cut a little bit, but uh, uh, not very much. Uh, so, so that that was. Uh, uh, 2020. And uh, the next uh, example is last year, uh, 2022. And uh, in, in, in the last year, and you can see that because of the uh, inflation pressure, Federal Reserve was uh, hiking rate very aggressively, where given that last year China was still under COVID. Uh, China economic uh, situation was uh, pretty much uh, uh, subdued and and, uh, and uh, de overall demand is weak. So that actually last year we uh, cut interest rate uh, a couple times and also lead the uh, lending rate, market rate uh, went down a little bit uh, last year. Uh, so, so that uh, if you look at the, this uh, period from uh, 2015 to, to this year, and you can see uh, the overall trend of China interest rate is a slow, uh, slowing uh, gradually uh, decreased. But uh, relative to the rest of the world, our interest rate has been fairly stable, fa fairly uh, uh, s stable. And uh, to understand the most important uh, uh, China uh, interest rate, I, I have a table here, and uh, these are the, the important rate. One is open market operation rate, uh, seven day repo, now it's 2%. And uh, the second one is the excess reserve uh, interest rate is 0.35. Uh, that's the, the lower bound of uh, our rate. Uh, and also, we have a, a standing loan facility uh, that is also seven, seven day. Now it's a 3%. Uh, that is actually the ceiling of the interest rate corridor. Uh, so that our market rate should be between 0.35 to uh, uh, 3%. But uh, our target is about 2%. That, that's, a, that's our uh, open market operation uh, rate. And then we have the mid-term lending facility. Uh, this is a one-year facility, and uh, this rate is 2.75. And the uh, government bond rate is very important. Uh, right now, the 10-year government bond in China yield at uh, 2.85. That is a 10-year government bond yield, and also uh, we have a loan prime rate, LPR, uh, for one year now is uh, 3.65, and more than five years is 4.3. That is uh, uh, about 20 banks, 20 commercial banks, including four or five foreign banks, uh, reporting uh, every year, uh, every month. And then we take the uh, average of whatever the uh, commercial bank uh, re report, they are uh, LPR. So that uh, uh, pretty much uh, we, uh, every day, every month at the uh, date of 20th of every month, uh, we have this 
in the morning uh, about these 20 banks reporting their LPR, and then they take a few top, take a few bottom ones, and the middle ones make a simple average is, uh, is uh, uh, this rate. It's a kind of uh, uh, the uh, long uh, uh, prime rate. So that if you look at this table, and you see uh, what is the floor and what is the, feeling, the ceiling of the uh, interest rate, and uh, in terms of lending, what is the lending rate, and uh, uh, what is the 10-year uh, government bond rate. Uh, basically, uh, that's the uh, uh, important uh, interest rate in China. And uh, at the beginning, I say that I try to make the uh, uh, real interest rate below the potential growth rate. The, the, the right line is uh, a real interest rate, and the blue line is the uh, potential growth rate. Uh, for, uh, for this century, uh, year 2000 all the way to, uh, to now, right? So that uh, basically, uh, you can see it's volatile, but, uh, but uh, our, our real rate uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, below uh, the potential rate. And now I take a few minutes to uh, uh, explain the uh, uh, exchange rate policy. And uh, basically, uh, interest rate is the key, and uh, exchange rate uh, is determined by the market. Uh, that, that's uh, the basic message. I want to uh, get across uh, so that uh, we have this uh, uh, exchange rate reform for a long time. And uh, as uh, Adam uh, introduced that, uh, I served seven years as the head of SAFE, which is uh, uh, take care of the, uh, uh, the capital control policy. And basically, basically during my uh, years of as head of SAFE, uh, I, I try to promote under, you see, I have to report to Governor Zhou Xiaochuan, and he was very supportive, and also we have to report to State Council, but basically what I was pushing was try to give the individual and uh, enterprise, especially private enterprise, the more freedom we give them, I feel uh, the, the better, so that give them more choice. So what, what we have done was that uh, for each individual, you can have a 50 US dollar uh, quota uh, every year, uh, just uh, you can, you, you can uh, uh, take the exchange uh, as you want. And for the private firms, uh, cross-border trade and investment is basically uh, if you have real trade background, economic background, they basically uh, let you go. Uh, that, that is, I gave uh, the individual household and uh, private firms the maximum amount of freedom. The reason I did that was because, you see, when I was a, a student or, or, or faculty, if I try to uh, use renminbi to change, uh, say, $10, it was very difficult. I have to ask a friend or ask somebody to, to do that. I, I, I hate that. I say that uh, people should have a, a choice. They can do it themselves. Don't have to ask a, a friend or a relative to do that. So, so that, uh, and uh, you see, at the beginning, people are very suspicious of this kind of policy, saying that if you have this, then you uh, would uh, explode the situation because people would uh, rush to change for US dollar and then this, the situation will be uh, collapsed. But uh, you see, this, this policy has been uh, for uh, more than 10 years. So far, it's, it's nothing collapsed, it's, it's okay. And uh, gave each individual uh, 50,000 US dollar as a quota they can free to, to, to do the change. Actually, 99% of people didn't use up that, this quota. So that which means 99% of people, they are unconstrained, which means they can, they can change as much as they want, right? And also, we satisfy most uh, uh, private, private firm, trading firm, investment firm, 
the need for for uh, foreign exchange, uh, U.S. dollar. So that that is uh, uh, try to uh, give the uh, market and uh, and the household the maximum amount of choice. Uh, and saying by saying that, uh, I. We, we still didn't say they are totally capital account convertible. Uh, you see, it's very careful. I try to give them maximum amount of freedom, but we didn't announce to say that uh, they are already capital account uh, uh, convertible. So that's that's a, a distinction, right? That's a distinction. And uh, if you look at the uh, renminbi versus U.S. dollar, that is the situation. And you can see that uh, in, in recent years, it's basically two-way uh, floating. And if you look at the, uh, say, uh, past 20 years, uh, renminbi uh, appreciate 20% against the U.S. dollar in the past 20 years. On average, 1% appreciation per year. And if you look at renminbi versus the BIS calculated basket of currencies in the past 20 years, the renminbi appreciate about 40% against the basket. So, so that's if you look at 20 years and renminbi's trend is appreciation, but if you look at the say past seven years, you can see the two-way two-way floating of the exchange rate. And um, this picture shows that uh, in the past five years, there are three times uh, where renminbi against the U.S. dollar depreciate above seven yuan to a dollar. But after uh, three months or five months, it, it come down to below uh, seven yuan to a dollar. Uh, you see here is a... Uh, 2019, due to the China-U.S. Uh, trade war, and this is due to the COVID, and here is due to the uh, very aggressive uh, uh, rate hiking uh, at, five, at Fed. Uh, so, so, but uh, basically, if you see, if you see our interest rate, if if our interest rate is stable, as I showed before, and then you see since the U.S. Uh, aggressively uh, increase uh, interest rate, and now the uh, U.S. government bond rate yield is much higher than the China government bond yield. Uh, you see, this the the blue line here. The blue line here is the differential of uh, U.S. and uh, China government bond. You see, for most time here, if, if the blue line below zero. It means that the U.S. yield and China yield, China yield is higher. Uh, usually, U.S. dollar is the dominant currency. China is the developing country. And to have the interest rate parity, China interest rate should be a little bit higher than the U.S. yield to make it equilibrium. That's the, that's the euro situation. But right now, here, and you can see uh, U.S., government bond yield is higher than China. Uh, but still, if you look at the capital movement and if you look at the exchange rate, it's, it's even given U.S. yield is higher, but now it's still in equilibrium. There is no sudden uh, large amount of capital flight or, 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 or something. Right? So that's the uh, uh, exchange rate. and. Uh, our market is deepened, and the more firms use the derivative and the future tools to hedging against the exchange risk, and basically the exchange rate market is more market-oriented. It's getting more market oriented so that uh, uh, if you have right monetary policy and uh, then I think uh, you make sure the exchange rate is determined by the market the central bank intervene as less as possible we gradually just face out our intervention to the market uh, we, we, we have the difficulty uh, 
you see, if you look at the history, central bank intervene in the exchange market. Sooner or later, market will defeat central bank. That's, that's the history of, uh, to me, that's the history of uh, monetary policy. So that uh, we have been, you see, try to maintain the exchange rate stable for some time. And uh, if you go this forever, then one day I would say that the market would defeat central bank. That's my, my belief. But uh, during the stability, if we can phase out the intervention, we, we say we no longer intervene. We, 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 we try to phase out the intervention. And gradually, the amount and the frequency of the intervention getting less and less, almost to zero. But again, at this time, I haven't announced that we have no intervention. And we, we still, in the policy statement, we still follow the uh, IMF suggestion that under the extreme capital uh, flight situation, we, 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 we reserve the right to, to intervene. Uh, but, uh, but basically, the, 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 the fact is that uh, we get intervene uh, as less as possible. And I, I think that, that's right. That's right. In order to, you have to intervene, you have to have a very strong team, right? You, you somebody have to make a decision. That, that's what bothers me. Even though I have a very excellent team, and even, even uh, myself uh, is it, it, working very hard. But uh, you see, again, it's the market. If you look at the market people, here we have many market people from hedge fund, from uh, uh, commercial bank, uh, securities, and so on. Certainly, the market people are more smart than government officials. That's, that's, no, that's, th that's, that's always true. That's always true. They are payment, they are earning is much higher than government <laughs> officials. So that given the, you see, so see the market is always right. Higher pay, you have a better quality people, right? <laughs> so, so that my belief is, uh, you see, you, you better just uh, face out this kind of intervention because it's, uh, it's not safe. Uh, it, it's, it's not safe. That, that is uh, my uh, belief. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, uh, you can see that uh, uh, because of the monetary policy I explained and the exchange rate I explained, we have a very stable uh, inflation situation. And uh, uh, last year, the whole world is bothered by higher inflation. Uh, but the China CPI inflation last year is 2%. And if you look at the last five years, the average CPI inflation of China is 2%. And if you look at the last 10 years, the average, the average CPI inflation of China is 2%. You see, the, the central bank's 2% uh, is the central bank dream, right? Every central bank say our target is 2%. And people, they, they, they spend a tremendous amount of time whether they want to go from 2% to 3%. They, they reluctant to do, to do that kind of uh, relaxation, right? 2% is the dream of the central banker, but uh, this is by coincident that uh, for, for China, we, we have 2% uh, in, in, in the recent uh, years. And uh, this is the balance of payments situation you can see that uh, the balance of payment as a percentage of GDP getting decreased. We, we, we do not pursue a current account surplus. We, I think uh, the best way is uh, current account more or less balance. And the best way is uh, uh, balance of payments is, uh, is, uh, is balanced. And uh, I will spend uh, a couple of minutes on the uh, structural monetary policy. Uh, I just say that uh, right now we have this uh, structural monetary policy mainly support small and medium enterprises. And uh, the outstanding at uh, People's Bank of China balance sheet is uh, 
trillion RMB, which about one trillion US dollar. And uh, this is about 15% of People's Bank of China balance sheet, so that we have 15% of our balance sheet to try to support the uh, uh, structural monetary policy. And uh, we have something called inclusive loan. And uh, that in China, uh, that, that is already uh, 24 trillion RMB. And this uh, uh, inclusive loan from the banking system is defined as a 10 million RMB loan or less, uh, about 1.5 million US dollar or less, right? This is for small and medium enterprises, usually for some mom and pop uh, enterprises. And uh, <coughs> this inclusive loan already reached uh, more than 56 million of small and medium enterprises. Uh, so, so that he, this is uh, one of the reasons that during, even during the COVID, uh, the, uh, we, we still preserve a large amount of small and medium enterprises not bankrupt. Well, of course, a lot of them bankrupt. But uh, without this uh, policy, it would have more small and medium enterprises went bust during the three year COVID period. So that, uh, that, uh, that helped a lot of uh, enterprises. And also we have another uh, policy I mentioned a little bit, that is a carbon emission reduction facility uh, by uh, People's Bank of China. Actually we have two, two of these facilities. Uh, we have this carbon uh, reduction facility uh, in 2021. Uh, so last year was the whole year, uh, have the complete year of last year. Uh, by, by now, we have a total something like uh, uh, more than uh, 300 billion RMB uh, central bank, uh, lower interest rate relending to the commercial bank. And then that mobilized uh, more than 600 billion RMB uh, commercial bank loan to support uh, the uh, carbon uh, reduction projects. Uh, and uh, uh, last year, as a result, uh, we have uh, uh, equivalent of 100 million ton of carbon uh, reduction uh, last year. So that uh, the commercial bank use this facility, they have uh, the responsibility of uh, disclosure they have to disclose quarterly on a quarterly basis about the carbon print, the product that they support, and also the uh, uh, other information related to uh, the uh, carbon reduction. Uh, and uh, this will make more uh, awareness of the society of citizens to know uh, who is uh, uh, emitting uh, carbon and, uh, and then make the to enhance the social awareness of the urgency of uh, climate change. Uh, and also this kind of information subject to the third party uh, institution verification and also in time theory manner. I think at this point, uh, you see, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very controversial for this green climate change uh, policies in China. T people have different opinions. For, from People's Bank of China point of view, we think that uh, disclosure is the most important. You have to make the information available. So our policy design is, uh, is emphasizing on the disclosure that all commercial banks use our policy, you have the uh, responsibility of doing the di disclosure, right? And uh, there is a little, you see, uh, greenwash activity or some uh, you see activity, it doesn't matter. As long as you just uh, disclose every quarter and uh, the third party institution uh, agencies, they can verify the society, they can know the, 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 the difference. Uh, and gradually the information will getting the quality, uh, they are getting uh, uh, better. So uh, that's the uh, key uh, takeaways, I, I basically uh, take this opportunity to explain the 
exchange rate uh, and uh, interest rate policy, uh, as well as at the end, I, I uh, explained a little bit about uh, the uh, structural monetary policy, uh, mainly supporting the small uh, enterprises and the uh, uh, climate change uh, activities. Thank you very much. <clears throat> There we go. I can talk quiet. Um, thank you so much, Governor Yi. You were comprehensive, clear, pointed, and I assure you all other central banks would indeed be very happy to have your uh, one-year, five-year, ten-year inflation record, uh, especially nowadays. Before we go to the audience, our distinguished colleagues, for questions, I'd just like to ask you a couple questions on some things in your presentation then about the world. Um, the first one was, uh, it was quite compelling you're putting up the chart and mentioning the desire to keep interest rates below the growth rate. <laughs> um, our colleague Olivier Blanchard, of course, has gotten us all t-shirts saying R minus G, you know, negative, that's good. Um, but this is the first time I've actually heard about a, a policymaker, let alone a monetary policymaker, talk about that. Um, was, so just if you could expand on that a little. Is, was this genuinely a part of the policy discussion to keep in mind the relative growth rate and the interest rate, especially when you're setting, as you said, attenuating policy? Or is this something after the fact you're happy to find it worked out this way? Yes, this, this has been a consideration. But uh, uh, of course, uh, as I said, that uh, the most difficult thing is uh, how to calculate it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, right now, the uh, real interest rate I showed up in the graph is the uh, bank lending rate minus uh, CPI inflation. That's the real interest rate. Right. And uh, the potential growth rate is also very controversial. And uh, you see, uh, my colleagues at Beida and uh, always think that uh, the potential growth rate is very high. And uh, the, the, the picture, the graph, I use the potential growth rate calculated by my colleague in Tsinghua University. So that uh, I think, uh, you see, it, 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 it is a theoretical ideal uh, situation. But uh, as far as uh, its uh, policy thinking is concerned, it's very difficult to calculate. But, uh, but uh, despite of that, if you have that kind of thinking and uh, as a guideline, uh, it, 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 it don't hurt to have this kind of uh, discussion. But uh, to answer Adam's question, in the real uh, economic policy or, or monetary policy decision making, uh, this R smaller than G uh, is uh, uh, little used. Yeah. No, makes sense. I was just surprised. Um, following up on, again, on your crystal clear explanation of interest rate policy, um, one thing which you did not mention, although of course it is part of the, um, the bank's remit, is the interaction between monetary policy and financial stability. I, I know that your title and your intent here was to focus on monetary policy practice, but this week we've had a number of central bank governors come through Peterson and make various declarations about the separability of financial stability and monetary stability, particularly Europeans saying 
there's no conflict between us raising rates and financial stability. Mm -hmm. How do you reflect on that question? Um, has, has financial stability been separable for you that you can use macro prudential and not interest rates? I, I think uh, that's a very uh, good question. It's a very deep question. Uh, in the normal situation, you have to conduct your monetary policy, major conquer the inflation. And, and uh, consider the financial stability, you see, uh, is, a, is a secondary. If, if this is the normal situation, this two decision could be separate in the normal situation. But in a period where you have real risk, especially you might have a systemic risk, financial stability danger ahead of you, then when you make the monetary policy interest rate hiking decision, you cannot totally separate with the financial stability situation. So, so, so that, uh, uh, and uh, you really have to uh, think this uh, uh, very uh, carefully uh, because uh, you see, as you uh, hiking the rate, uh, you have to, th th there is an impact on the credit uh, ability. Uh, and also there is, there is an impact on the uh, assets that financial institution holding. Uh, and also uh, there is an impact on uh, other things. And all the above, they have implications of, uh, could be, have impact on the uh, financial stability uh, situation. Uh, so that uh, to answer uh, your question, uh, for central bankers, uh, they, they think that uh, in the normal situation, these two decisions should be separated. But uh, for practical purposes, uh, then sometimes, especially in a dangerous uh, period, you have to consider them uh, jointly. And at the People's Bank of China, our mandate is uh, uh, price stability and financial stability. So that this is a twin, twin pillar for us. So that uh, from the mandate, we have to consider uh, the both. Yes. If I could just follow up on that, um, coming out of the two Congresses and recent decisions, uh, it's been widely reported that there's a reorganization of uh, some of the uh, financial supervisory and regulatory agencies to some degree in China. Mm -hmm. Um, leaving aside the issue that this may mean that people in the government will be even lower paid versus people in the market, um, which frankly I think is inverse to worth, but that's just me. Um, just more broadly, how should we think about the uh, planned or underway reorganization of financial stability organizations in China? Are you creating more of an FSOC like the U.S. aspires to? The uh, recent uh, decision uh, is that uh, China will establish uh, the National Financial Supervisory Authority based on CBIRC. Uh, you see, now we have, uh, we have CBIRC. Everybody familiar with that? Right, based on uh, CBIRC, uh, China will uh, establish a national financial uh, supervisory authority. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, that uh, probably can uh, strengthen uh, financial uh, supervision. And uh, you see, after that, People's Bank of China is still the central bank. And also we have uh, the responsibility of uh, uh, part of the uh, uh, banking and uh, uh, also uh, we have a supervisory uh, responsibility on something like a payment, like a cash 
uh, issuance and something like uh, the, the infrastructure and so on and so forth. But uh, the main supervisory uh, authority and the responsibility will be uh, under the National Financial Supervisory Authority, uh, all the banking and the insurance, except uh, the capital market and the security will be continue to be supervised by CSRC. So CSRC remain the same, uh, continue to take care of the uh, security and the capital market. Whereas the new institution established uh, called National Financial Supervisory Authority will take the entire banking insurance, including the consumer uh, protection uh, uh, responsibilities. Thank you for clarifying. Um, let me ask one more question or pair of questions on the exchange rate because it was terrific given your background and your knowledge to have you take us through recent years of the Chinese exchange rate policy. But let me say any of our audience members who wish to ask Governor Yi a question, if you could go to the mic that's standing there in the middle. Um, I'll be happy to recognize you next. Uh, Jessica is kindly making the mic where it should be. Um, so on the exchange rate, if I could, two questions. I mean, first off, just to say one of the many reasons I and others think of you as a great technocrat is that you have been slowly pushing for this more market-determined exchange rate in the interest of the Chinese people and talking about freedom as you did. Um, and so we admire that, or at least I do. Um, so two questions. First is, amidst your description of the last decade plus, there really didn't seem to be much mention of what happened in 2015, where, as I recall, there seemed to be some market turmoil uh, around uh, a slight opening further of the uh, capital account. Our mutual friend and colleague, uh, Yu Yongding at the time, of course, was saying, um, former PBLC advisor, was saying, you know, it's terrible to open up. Um, how, do you, how do you assess this? Was, the, was, was, there a, was there a specific trigger of large capital flows? I mean, I'm just juxtaposing this with your very striking fact that 99% of households don't use their 50,000 a year. So just if you could put in context why there was such a big capital outflow then and now it seems relatively stable. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, we do have uh, uh, market uh, pressures in 2015. Uh, let me have the pressure of uh, depreciation. And uh, also you can see ob obvious uh, decrease of the official uh, foreign exchange reserve during that uh, uh, period. But I think uh, uh, if you look, look it back, uh, the lesson you want to uh, learn from that episode is that uh, uh, how to manage uh, expectation. I, I think if, if you have the uh, household and the enterprise and also plus the foreign investor uh, they, they are expectation getting uh, diverged, and then uh, you have a tremendous uh, uh, pressures. And uh, also, uh, that, that's the first uh, lesson. The second lesson is that uh, uh, you see, even under the pressure, you have to uh, believe that uh, uh, market adjustment is uh, by and large and uh, rational. And then if you uh, continue to uh, make the uh, policy and the mechanism to be market designed uh, exchange rate policy, and then eventually it will uh, go back to equilibrium. Actually in 2015, uh, they there is a debate. There is a debate that whether you should take back all the policies like a 50,000 US dollar per person policy and you should restrict the, the uh, uh, capital control policy. 
And uh, we, we used some of the macro prudential policies, but we didn't take back the most important parameter, like I said, the enterprise uh, choice of, of trade and the investment uh, need of exchange. And we didn't take back uh, 50,000 per person uh, policy. But uh, still, the, the rate getting uh, stabilized. Uh, so so that, that, that is actually a test. Uh, actually, uh, it's, a, it's a test. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, if you have the ability of maintain the, uh, have a guidance of uh, market expectation well, and also if, if you believe that uh, the, uh, the market uh, uh, mechanism, uh, I, I would say that uh, this kind of, uh, uh, you see, uh, exchange rate mainly determined by the market and demand and using a basket of currencies as, uh, as a guidance. And basically, uh, you can still call it a managed floating regime, but uh, it has to be primarily uh, determined by the market. It's still working. Thank you very much. Um, we want to get in as many questions as possible. The governor has generously agreed to stay a couple minutes past 12. Um, so I'm going to ask people at the mic, identify yourself, ask your question, and we're going to take two at a time, please. So first. It has doubled. Uh, how has that gone? And what are your feelings about the growing use of the renminbi in trade in the years ahead? Thank you. Next, please. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Helen, Helen Chow, Chief Greater China Economist at B of A. Um, I have a more technical question for Governor E. Um, so we have a proprietary indicator on financial conditions on China, primarily made of interest rate, exchange rate, and total social financing growth. Um, so far, we, it has been performing really well as a leading indicator, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, telling us where the growth would be uh, going towards. However, in the past four to five years, as the increase of the structural monetary policy tools has stepped up, we realized that the financial conditions you know, tracking has not been as accurate as before. So actually going back to your slide. Please make it a question. Yes, going back to the slides that you had, which is using the interest rate listed on your slides, uh, the market rates, the policy rates. Unfortunately, I, I, I still see You a say divorce. unfortunately. Please make it a question and come to a conclusion. So what would be a suggestion for you for, for, for addressing such a problem that there is a divorce between using such policy rates and looking at uh, China's financial conditions? Thank you. I, I, I would just note, speaking for the nonprofit sector, whether banks' proprietary financial conditions indices are a good predictor of events is, I'm not sure, a policy concern, but maybe, maybe the governor sees it differently. Please. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, two uh, very good uh, uh, question. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, the uh, the Minbi use uh, uh, abroad, uh, elsewhere. Uh, I think it's a market. Uh, oriented uh, activity and uh, we respect the choice of enterprises and uh, household. Uh, if they want to use renminbi, uh, that's fine. If they want to use the US dollar, uh, euro, and, and, uh, and the Japanese yen, uh, that, that's fine too. I think it should be have the level field of, of uh, equal uh, competition. Uh, given that uh, China's uh, trade and uh, uh, investment activity uh, getting uh, <coughs> large scale, uh, I think uh, it is natural for some enterprise feel that uh, it's convenient to use the renminbi and save some uh, uh, foreign exchange cost. Uh, I, I, I think that that is fine. But uh, in our policy, uh, we would like to make the level of playing field being uh, uh, equal. Uh, for uh, Chao Hong's uh, uh, question, uh, I, I think uh, uh, I have to look at it, your question. Your question is a very good question. 
uh, but uh, I have to <coughs> look at this uh, situation, the financial condition index, and uh, using the interest rate and the exchange rate and also uh, total social finance and so on and so forth to overall estimate the uh, financial condition. Uh, and uh, you pointed out a very good question uh, that is uh, uh, suggesting there, is, there might be some divergence of the policy rate and uh, market rate. That is uh, a phenomenon that uh, uh, I, I think uh, I want to avoid. And then basically I, I, I announced my policy rate uh, and I think that policy rate should uh, influence the market rate and uh, basically the resources allocation and the financial, uh, the fund allocation should be allocated by the uh, market rate. That, that's my, the design of my, my policy. But, uh, but it's a good question. I have to look at it and uh, see uh, whether it, it, it's a, a diverge or create some problem. If you have a writing, let me know and send it to me and I, I will look at it. Thank you. Next two questions, please. Thank you. Um, Rory McFarker. Uh, Governor E. Do I'm you have an affiliation, Mr. McFarker? I don't currently have an affiliation. Thank you for clarifying. Um, Governor E., uh, you formerly ran an institution called SAFE. And a year ago, the United States government uh, froze Russia's foreign exchange reserves in dollars, which might make them seem perhaps unsafe for a country like China, which has some friction in its geopolitical relationship with the United States. I'm wondering how that affects the way you think about your international financial stability and the status of your foreign exchange reserves. Thank you. Next question, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Masahiro Okoshi from Nikkei, Japanese newspaper. Uh, a simple question about the uh, Sri Lanka's debt problem. Uh, Japan and uh, India, uh, France announced a common platform for uh, talks among bilateral creditors to coordinate re restructuring the uh, Sri Lanka's debt. So, simple question: Do you think China should join this platform, or if not, uh, what kind of idea do you have to resolve this problem? Thank you. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, for the first question, we will uh, uh, continue our policy. I, I think uh, you see this world uh, is a, a world a rule of law, and uh, it, there is an international economic and a financial architecture. Uh, you see. Uh, globalization, free trade, uh, we have uh, IMF and the World Bank, uh, WTO, uh, you see on, on the <coughs> uh, governance, we, we have a United Nations. I think uh, uh, we, you see, we have to uh, really uh, think that uh, under this uh, uh, global economic and financial uh, order, and uh, that that's the uh, uh, best for the uh, welfare of uh, people in the world, in, in, even uh, for, for for different country. Uh, that's that's the best uh, for us. For the uh, second question, that uh, you know that uh, you specifically mentioned the Sri Lanka case, and you know that. Uh, uh, China, we committed to G20 common framework. Uh, Sri Lanka is a middle income country. It's uh, outside of uh, common framework. But I think uh, uh, still uh, debt uh, sustainability is uh, uh, very important. And you know that uh, if you, if you deeper, dig a little bit deeper, and you know that uh, uh, recently, MF discussed the Sri Lanka uh, case and uh, China, uh, Exim Bank uh, representing uh, China uh, to uh, issue the 
financial assure letter uh, to the uh, uh, <coughs> case. So I think uh, for combating the global debt distress, it need international cooperation. And I, I think uh, uh, certainly uh, in, in this uh, uh, very serious situation of global uh, debt uh, distress, and uh, we should uh, work together and the international uh, cooperation is uh, uh, more important. And if we can cooperate, if we can have an equal and a fair share of the burden, I, I think uh, we can uh, solve the problem. Thank you very much. Um, we are just about out of time, so these will be the last two questions. Again, without prejudicing any against anyone, if you could be brief, please. Hi, my name is Max Gunlock. I'm a sophomore at the Georgetown School of Foreign Service. I just have a quick question. Um, I know you've emphasized in the past that China's looking to shift to full currency convertibility. When do you see that in your eyes, and how do you think that will affect the yuan, either going up or down? Thank you. Next and last question, please. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, I'm Orange from South China Morning Post, the DC Bureau, the Hong Kong newspaper. Uh, so we noticed that uh, Governor Yi, you have met uh, Chair Paul during the spring meetings. Uh, well, the statement is pretty brave. So just wondering, could you share more about this meeting and what's your takeaway from that? And also, uh, by any chance, you could have any opportunity to have a conversation with Secretary Yellen during the spring meeting. Uh, because Yellen said uh, she still hoped to visit China. Just wondering, uh, could you also comment on that? Thanks. Thank you, Governor. But the first question, what convertibility? Yeah, I, I, I think you, you made some of this clear during your speech, but it was a question of is there a date in mind at which the yuan would become fully convertible? Uh, to make it simple, uh, right now we don't have that uh, date, but uh, I will continue to have the policy to make uh, further convenience for household and uh, business, especially small uh, private business to use uh, foreign uh, exchange. Uh, that, that is a, a simple answer. For the question of the second question, I think uh, uh, we just had uh, the uh, G20 uh, finance minister and the central bank governors meeting, and we have the uh, uh, IMF and uh, World Bank uh, spring meeting. I, I think uh, uh, the overall uh, tone of uh, those meetings and also bilateral uh, meetings uh, are that uh, uh, we, we have the challenges uh, and uh, the international organizations predict that uh, uh, the growth, uh, global economic growth of this year is, uh, is not a very uh, high number. Uh, and you know the IMF prediction and the World Bank prediction. And also the inflation situation is still challenging. And plus we have uh, uh, energy and the food uh, situation it's pretty tough, and uh, also we have uh, the uh, uh, debt distress uh, problem. So given all the problem we have, and it is the spirit of the meeting that uh, international uh, macro uh, policy coordination is in important, we should have a concrete uh, consultation and uh, more efficient uh, action to solve those uh, international uh, problems. And uh, then uh, at this uh, time, uh, solidarity and uh, cooperation and uh, coordination or exchange of information is uh, uh, important. And uh, of course, we, we, we think that uh, for the uh, uh, largest uh, economies, major economies uh, at this point, uh, the uh, uh, com communication and the policy uh, cooperation is uh, even more uh, important. Uh, that uh, is uh, 
uh, <coughs> our uh, thinking and also uh, during the, the, the discussion of the meeting, uh, a lot of people have uh, very good uh, proposals and uh, discussions. Uh, I would certainly like to see uh, those uh, become uh, policy uh, reality and uh, make uh, the people of the world uh, better off. Thank you. Thank you so much, Governor. It's a, it's a beautiful note to conclude today's event, to also conclude the Peterson Institute for International Economics Macro Week 2023, a culmination not just because Governor Yi is so important and the People's Bank so important to the future of the world and economic policy, but because he once again demonstrated the issue of good faith substantive dialogue and commitment to trying to get the policy right. And again, I just want to thank you, Governor, for honoring us with your presence today. We look forward to continuing these discussions constructively with the People Bank, with all of you, and with everyone online who's watched today's event. Thank you very much. Thank you.